please take a moment just to be in silence with me. And to gather yourselves in the present moment. Feel your feet on the floor, your hands on your lap, or wherever they're resting. And if you can muster, just allow a smile to come to your face. We thank you, God, for this day, for this life. We thank you for our time again. Amen. So, saying goodbye is never an easy thing. Saying goodbye involves change, and we're often creatures of habit. So change is a, is a disruption from our, our normal routine big and large changes that, you know, we don't always welcome changes. But I want you to do one quick thing. I just want you to look at these two boards. Or I guess four boards, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and just look at how many ministers you've seen here since 1651. Take you a couple minutes just to count how many ministers, wouldn't it? But it's pretty... Incredible, which is in the midst of all those changes, there's there's something that's that's constant. And though Jim's not here, if you read Jim's book about the heritage of the Elliott Church, you'll see just just how many different forms and shapes the community that has gathered on this physical space has taken. And so this is also a time of change and a time of transition. Because when I leave, I won't be part of the ministries of the religious education program anymore at the Elliott Church. I won't be coming back for pastoral visits or weddings or funerals. I'm even taking a, what they call like a six month fast from the church. And you know, if you're like me, you're probably like, you know, so what is this fast thing? Because I didn't really understand when I first started in seminary and from my ministerial colleagues. And it wasn't until kind of I had an analogy from my own life that I was really able to understand it. So when I first went to Belize, as a teacher when I graduated from college, I was teaching religious studies and physical education at Sadie Run High School, which was an all-girls high school. And right before me, in the same position, there was a guy named James, probably about the same height as me, also a goofy white guy. And, you know, he had the same exact position. So for about the first six months, probably more, that I was there, I was James. If I wasn't called James and I was compared with James, and it wasn't finally until months after, month, I, I can't even count how many months, that finally I started to develop my own identity as a teacher at St. Martin. Thank God people finally started to call me Matt instead of James. And so I thank God for James who gave me the space to kind of create my own teaching identity while I was at St. Vernon. And at the same time, James had a new teaching position in the United States. And so that honored the fact that his plate was full with, with his own new responsibilities. And so teaching is different than ministry, but it's similar too, because when I leave, my, my fast kind of allows whoever my successor is to, to get their own ministerial identity here, especially in those first few months when it's more difficult to do so, while also honoring my new ministries that I'll be doing, and I'll be focused and concentrated on them. And it may be a little bit confusing in some respects because I'll still be involved in the West Virginia work camp, which is a, a work camp trip that I've gone on since I was a freshman in high school, right after I had been confirmed at the First Congregational Church downtown where I grew up. And since that's an ecumenical trip that happens through many churches in Natick, I'll still be involved with that. So it, it can be a little bit confusing, but in the midst of all the changes and then transitions, there's so much to celebrate and so much to remember. I remember fondly the times, the lock-ins. I think it was two separate lock-ins when both Adam and Rich hurt themselves playing flashlight tag. Wasn't it two? Yeah, it was two separate ones. Two separate ones, yeah. They like thanked, to spread it out. <laughs> thankfully, they recovered. I'll, I'll, I just remember and I celebrate the trips paintballing in the Canopy Lake Park and whitewater rafting and Six Flags. I'll remember with joy the service Sundays and the service Saturdays where we came together to 
work to, to end hunger and end poverty, whether it was through making emergency hygiene kits or packaging meals for local food shelters, or whether it was through doing a project for Family Promise Metro West or the Native Service Council, or whatever, it, or the environmental projects, or a Cool and Chill Summit cleanup, or a Pegan Cove Co cleanup. All those things I'll remember with joy. I'll remember with joy the adult forums after church, and of course, the many, like, 15 varieties of chili at the Chili Fest. I remember the, the times that we spent together in conversations after church and in coffee hour. I remember and celebrate all those times that we spent teaching and learning and growing together in Sunday school and confirmation class and youth group. But most of all, I think most, most of all, I remember and celebrate the love that we shared together in worship, in the space, and as a community. Because it's that love that you, you welcomed me with four years ago that made me and Me and Latoya feel so welcome here. And so in the midst of all the changes that will happen, love is going to remain here in this church. Love will remain a constant in this church. Because you see, ministers come and go, as you can see from this board. People come and go in this church all the time. But what remains at the heart and at the core is love. Because you see, God is love. And God's kingdom is in each one of us. And so love is who and what you are and who and what I am. And so love it's not, it is a feeling, it can be expressed as a feeling, but it's more than a feeling. Love is a force. It's a force more powerful than any other force in the world. It's not some sentimental hogwash. When we, and when we tap into love, that unconditional and agape love that Jesus tapped into, then we live out and express and embody that love of God. Because love can never fail. Love is eternal. Love can never, ever be forgotten because love is who and what you are. So I'm going to close with a story. And this story is about a pastor. A pastor who was called to reopen a church in suburban Brooklyn. This was some years back, and this is, this is a true story. And when he and his wife got to the church in early October, they went into the church to see what it looked like, and they saw that, man, that church was in pretty bad shape. And so they were surprised, but they still had, they still had hope. They said, you know what, we are going, our goal is to start our first church service on Christmas Eve. That's our goal. So they got to work right away. They started rebuilding the pews, plastering. Just imagine, this, this could be the church right here, right, with all the stuff happening. Rebuilding the pews, plastering, painting, all this stuff. And they were in such good shape, they were ahead of schedule. So that on December 18th, they said, we are all set for our Christmas Eve service. On December 19th, there was a terrible tempest that hit the Brooklyn and New York region. It lasted for two days, driving rain. So on December 21st, when the pastor came back to visit the church, he was devastated because he saw that the roof had leaked. And so there was this portion of the front wall right in the sanctuary, right behind the pulpit, with this big, huge piece of plaster, probably about 8 feet by 20 feet, that had fallen down. And so the pastor picked up the fallen pieces, and he went home thinking, well, there's not much else I can do besides cancel the Christmas Eve service. But as he was going home, he noticed that there was a flea market that a local business was having for charity. And so he stopped in, and he saw at this flea market that there was this beautiful, handmade, exquisitely crafted, embroidered quilt with ivory colors, such fine colors, and this big cross right in the middle. He said, I'm going to get that tablecloth, that, that quilt. And so he got it. And he, started, he, said, he said, you know what, that's probably just about the same size as that, as that area that fell out in the sanctuary. 
And so he was about to start to head home from the flea market when he saw that there was a woman on the opposite side of the street. And she had just actually missed her bus. She was about to take a bus and she missed it. And so the pastor offered for her to come into the church and wait in the warmth because it had just started to snow. So he said, why don't you come into the church and wait for the next 45 minutes until the next bus comes. And so she did and she sat, she sat there, not really paying much attention while the pastor got up the ladders, ladder in the hangar, and started to put up the tablecloth. And once it was on, the pastor was so excited because it fit perfectly. It covered the problem area almost to a T. And so once that tablecloth was up, the woman started walking out from the pew, and her face was like a sheet. She said, Pastor, where did you get that tablecloth? And he said, he, he explained where he had gotten it from. She said, I made, oh, she said, would you look, go look in the right lower hand corner of that quilt and see if EBG is crocheted in there. He did, and sure enough, EBG was in the right lower hand corner of the tablecloth. She said, you know what, I made that quilt, that tablecloth, 35 years ago in Austria. At the time, she told the pastor, my husband and I were well-to-do people in Austria. And then the Nazis came. And my husband made me leave first for safety. And he was supposed to follow afterwards, but he was captured and arrested and put in prison. And we haven't seen each other in all the 35 years in between them. I haven't seen my home. Well, the pastor said, well, he insisted that she take the tablecloth. But she said, she refused adamantly. She said, no, you have to keep this tablecloth here for the church. So the pastor said, well, the least I can do is to drive you to your home. And she was only in Brooklyn for the day because she, she had a house cleaning job. And so he took her all the way to Staten Island to take her home. And three days later, they had the most beautiful and exquisite Christmas Eve service. And the church was almost full and the music and the spirit were so wonderful. And afterwards, people greeted the pastor and his wife and a lot of them said that they would come back and were just really enthusiastic. But there was one man who was sitting in the back towards the end and the pastor wondered what he was still doing there. And the pastor asked him, he said, is everything okay? He said, pastor, where did you get that tablecloth? Because that tablecloth looked just, just like one that my wife made me in Austria 35 years earlier. You see, he explained to the pastor, my wife and I were living in Austria at the time, and the Nazis came, and I forced my wife to flee, and she got, she got away, but you know, I was captured soon after and arrested and put in prison, so I haven't seen my wife or my home all the 35 years in between. The pastor said, would you mind taking a little ride with me? So they rode together from Brooklyn to Staten Island. The pastor helped the man to walk up the three flights of stairs. When they knocked on the door and opened, the pastor saw the most beautiful Christmas reunion he could ever imagine. You see, love, love can never be lost, can never be got, forgotten. Love is who and what you are. Love is who and what God is. So it's that love that I hold close to my heart in all our, our four years together. And it's that love that I hope we will continue to share and that remains in this community no matter who comes and goes. And so I know that in the midst of it all that we will meet again.